You can't have an ice age without ice. In the sapling, players can increase and decrease the global temperature, and the soil color will change to reflect that, giving you instant information about the world. Playtesters are responding to this feature so well that I really want to expand on this idea. But what could be other ways I can tell the player about how hot or cold or wet or dry an area is? So, for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own algae, plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. So, to recap from an earlier episode, any land location in the sapling has a temperature, shallow groundwater level, a deep groundwater level, a rockiness and a wind strength, where the first two are the most important. When it is really cold, the terrain will of course be white, but above freezing temperatures I have defined four colors. One for low temperature and low groundwater, one for high temperature and low groundwater, one for low temperature and high groundwater, and one for high temperature and high groundwater. But, of course, these are typical properties you don't only see on the ground. That's why, as part of this update, there will also be particle effects. Most of these include clouds in one way or the other, which are created by changing the default particles to a more cloudy texture and making them much larger. The next step is letting their transparency start at zero, become slightly less transparent during their peak, and then slowly fade out again. And as a final touch, I set the speed to a random but much lower value. Oh, and we can have more control over the cloud by changing the size to a box. Okay, starting with the wetter areas, the coldest ones will have snow, which of course has the cloud particle system and a second one below it which is created by setting the particles to a random but much smaller size and then increasing the amount per second. And then for the ultimate snowy look, randomizing the direction and speed, but making it more likely they will go down. The slightly warmer temperatures get mist, basically another cloud particle system, but somewhat larger and more transparent. An extra requirement for mist is that the area is not too windy. Temperatures even warmer get rain, which is very similar to snow, but now the particles will go straight down at a random speed, and the particles are much more grey and stretched. And finally, the hottest area gets thunder, which takes the two rain particle systems as a base and adds a third really special one, which only emits three particles every two seconds that move really fast in a random direction but down. The movement of these particles is then adjusted by a very strong and chaotic noise texture. It might be a bit hard to see this way, but we'll change that by adding a trill. Then, for the drier areas, I originally had nothing for colder temperatures, but strangely, in one week three players suddenly all suggested sandstorms, which got me thinking. This might actually fit perfectly. It's nearly the same as the mist particle system, but colored and individual particles move faster. This is because, unlike mist, which requires areas with low wind strength, sandstorms only show up in areas with high wind strength. Finally, for the warmer temperatures, I again use the thunderstorms, but this time without rain. The weather area definitions have all kinds of nice, unintended interactions with the simulation. For example, areas that are near larger bodies of water tend to be more rainy, and the same is true for mist, but in particular near mountains, because it is less windy there. A nice side advantage is that it is really easy to make these particle effects audio sources as well. Rain, dry thunder, wet thunder and sandstorms will all make noise, adding some more character to the game. To make some space for these sound effects in the audio mix, I've made some changes to the music as well. Those of you that have seen the very first video for this game might remember that the idea is that the various actions taken by the player influence the game's music. So if you zoom all the way out, you get very large music. And before, if you zoomed in, I took out the high violins and double basses to make it a little smaller, 
but it's still 11 violins playing. I have now decided to dial back even further and only use a single violin, which sounds like this. I was unsure when I experimented with this in the music software, but I immediately noticed how well this works in the actual game, because now you can really clearly hear the music respond to your actions. And this got me thinking, what if I extend this system a little bit? Because so far the music might be procedural, but the only really interactive thing about music is zooming in and out. And the extra rhythm track that is added when you speed up. What if I create some extra musical fragments to be played depending on what kind of terrain you are looking at? The first idea I got in mind here is that I wanted Middle Eastern instruments for the hot and dry areas. Of course, not all of the Middle East is hot and dry, but I think it's an association a lot of players will have. I'm using instruments like the Oud, the Nai and the Comanche here. Interestingly, this idea provided a musical challenge as well, because it's not just the timbre that makes something sound Middle Eastern. It's also the fact that Middle Eastern music features a variety of musical scales. The music engine in the sapling is constantly mixing small musical fragments, and they all sound good together because they all use the same set of seven notes, and completely ignore the remaining five. But using some of these five other notes is exactly what gives a melody that Middle Eastern flavor. After a lot of experimentation, I've created little melodies that I think are somewhere in between. They leave the western scale every now and then, just enough to sound Middle Eastern, but also stay close enough to the western major scale to fit with the rest of the music. For Mist, on the other hand, I had the opposite problem. I knew the notes I wanted, but I couldn't find a good instrument. In the end, I used the famous silent synthesizer to create a Vangelis-like sound. The music for Rain, finally, was done in 20 minutes or so. I just took a harp and played lines that go down. And that sounds like this. Since snow is essentially frozen rain, I thought it would be a nice touch if the melodies for snow are exactly the same, but played with a glockenspiel. As you can imagine, as I was implementing this, I saw quite a lot of terrains in quick succession. And this made me realize that plants really show the temperature of an area, but not how much water there is in the soil. And this got me thinking, isn't there a really visual way for plants to show that they are built for water? Okay, since I'm working on making terrain stats more visible, this might be the perfect moment to do that roots overhaul I've been wanting to do for so long. The old system was actually pretty simple. If you make the roots like this, you get the minimum amount of water, and if you make them like this, you get the maximum amount. To prevent players from always having these wide roots, plants with these roots won't grow in rocky soil. When I designed this system, I thought it would lead to interesting situations, but in practice it's mostly annoying. Imagine spending lots of time designing a beautiful tree, only to discover that the place where you intended it to grow has a rocky soil, so it does not support right roots, so it does only support plants that don't need a lot of groundwater, meaning that your creation should be considerably smaller and that you can basically start from scratch designing a plant. This is not a good player experience, and very different from how basically all other plant parts work. For leaves, for example, you might discover that the leaf you have just chosen cannot handle the temperature on your planet. So you go back, change all leaves to another one in one go, and try again. Therefore, from the next update onwards, roots will also work like this. There will be multiple root types, all of which can give you maximum groundwater, but each root type limits where the plants can grow. 
The old taproot will now only grow in drier areas, but has the advantage that you can also make them very deep, allowing access to deep groundwater that the other root types cannot reach. The new default roots are these ones, fibrous roots for the wetter environments. Unlike the tap roots, they can even grow in locations that are 100% wet, that is, underwater. They cannot handle soil that is too soft though. For that situation, we now have these stilt roots to provide extra support. So if you see these stilt roots evolve somewhere, you can be pretty sure this area is wet and has a soft soil, not unlike how a sandstorm tells you an area is windy and dry or how you can identify a rainforest because you see, and hear, rain. <laughs> no, wait a minute. There is one more thing I want to tell you about. So now we have a whole new tool to track extinctions. And now we also have dry thunderstorms, but we do not connect these ideas. We need one more.